read the best books first. You may not have a chance to read them at all. That's by Henry David Thoreau. My name is Tammy Rose, and welcome to Concord Days. I have with me Richard Smith and Jamie Giroff of the Barrow Bookstore. How are you guys doing? Nice to see you, Tammy. Nice to see you, Jamie. Thank you for joining us today. And nice to see you both. Thanks for having us here today. Thank you so much. I think that the the Barrow um, Bookshop is like one of my favorite places in Concord. Um, I sort of made a joke with you, or, or you know, the other day, uh, JB, when I was in there, saying that like, oh, it's it's re really lovely to visit cemeteries, um, which is one of the things. My I know Richard is what it loves doing that. He loves bringing flowers to um, our lovely heroes to honor them and to honor their their earthly remains. But I love going into a bookshop because that's where I feel all of the author's voices come alive. And I have to tell you, uh, right now, the laptop is set up on a shelf. So the two of you are sandwiched between, you've got Ralph Waldo Emerson on your left, uh, Thoreau is on your right, Margaret Fuller is below you, Nathaniel Hawthorne is above you, and Louisa is about a foot and a half to Tammy's right. So you are <laughs> surrounded by many friends here at the moment. We're in good company. <laughs> you are, you are. So Literally. Jamie, uh, tell us a little bit about Barrow Books and, and, and how long it's been around and, and how you got involved with the bookstore. So Barrow Bookstore is a wonderful small store. It's tucked down an alleyway in Concord Center. We're right opposite Kai's Road and the cemetery across the road. So the bookstore was started in 1971 by Claiborne Dawes. And originally she was going to have a wheelbarrow and wheel her books around town like an old fashioned bookseller. But then that's quite heavy to try and push a Victorian <laughs> cart full of books. So she opened the bookstore instead, parked the, book, uh, the wheelbarrow out front. And that's where the name the Barrow Bookstore comes from. So the store has always specialized in Concord authors, American history, particularly Concord history, uh, transcendentalism, and just literature in general. The store was then later owned by Pamela Fenn, who was the director of the Old Manse Museum in Concord. So there's a lot of history of people working here who also worked for the museums. And my mother, Nancy, she worked for Pam. Um, so when we were growing up, we were always in this bookshop. And then my sister, Aladdin, currently owns the Barrow Bookstore. So again, she kind of grew up in the shop. She loves books. It's her dream to own a bookstore. And it's just, it's a great place because it's a way for us to keep in touch with all the stories of Concord, but also people who love that as well, like you and your viewers and people all over the world. It's just, it's nice. It's like coming home because you get to meet people who really appreciate the same history, you know, and who have built their own upon it. And of course, Claiborne Dawes, who started the bookshop, she is a Concord author in her own right, uh, having is. written a series of children's books uh, about Louisa Alcott and Henry Thoreau. She did. She wrote children's books, and then she collaborated with other Concord authors to write like some of the guidebooks about Concord, uh, like some of the like the old Concord books, like that books about right. Concord. Oh. Right. I love. Them. I, have, I have some of those. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jamie, you've yeah. been kind of surrounded by all of these Concord writers most of your life, whether you wanted to or not. <laughs> right. So my mother loves Concord history. She always has. Um, she is a, a teacher who loves literature. And we were very lucky that we grew up in Concord. And she worked at Orchard House. She was a director of education at Orchard House for a number of years. So again, my sister who owns the bookstore and I, we were both guides in the town and that's where we met people like Richard Smith um, and other tour guides throughout years. Now, of course, the bookstore now isn't just Concord authors. It, you've kind of expanded into all genres and, and all sorts of things, correct? Yeah, so the bookstore, everything here is gently read or a rare or something unique about it. Um, we have, you know, every section that most bookstores would have, biographies, mysteries, young adult, just every, every different category. But again, the specialty is Concord authors. Now, do you find that people who come into the store, are they coming in 
primarily for what we now call the Concord authors and the Concord history books, or are they coming in for just about everything else? It's probably just about everything else, and especially with COVID, because tourists are not coming here as much. The Concord stuff is not moving that much right now, but it's always something of interest. But again, every every category is the general everyday sales here. Mm. So tell us about some of the of the your favorite rare things that you have in the shop right now. Well, my favorite Concord author and one of my favorite authors in general is Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, I just I love his stories, the way he combines old history with the tales. Like it just brings it all to life in an interesting manner. And we have a complete set of Hawthorne's works here, published by Houghton Mifflin in 1906. And what Houghton Mifflin did around that time, they did it with Thoreau's works as well and, and other authors. They would take something signed by the author and bind it into one of the books. And that was just a way of increasing the value and, and interest in the book. So we have this complete set of Hawthorne. Every volume is signed by the illustrator, and the very first volume in the book is signed by Rose Hawthorne, Hawthorne's daughter, the publisher Houghton Mifflin, and in it is bound a customs house receipt for when Hawthorne worked at the customs house in Salem, and it's signed by Hawthorne, and it's mainly for Jameson's Irish whiskey, a large shipment that is coming through the port in Salem. So that's personally my favorite thing at the moment. <laughs> Um, in the store. Now, my sister, Aladdin, the one who owns it, uh, her favorite author is Dickens, which is part of the reason you rarely see collectible Dickens in the store, because she keeps them. So, that's <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, if you're going to own a bookstore, you have to have some perks, right? <laughs> I think that's kind of what, what has been agreed upon by now. <laughs> yeah. well, and it's interesting you should mention what Houghton Mifflin was doing with those editions. And like you said, they did the same thing. Uh, they published, quote unquote, the works of Henry David Thoreau, and they were literally taking pages of his journal and putting them into these first editions of the books. And every now and again, you'll still see one of those uh, editions popping up with the actual page from, from Thoreau's journal still inside the book. Yes, we were lucky that a few years ago, we had one of those sets here in the store. It actually had a page from Wild Apples in it. Was it Wild Apples? Um, I think it's Wild Apples. Yeah. Um, but I remember it was delivered and it was delivered to the wrong store in Concord. So the, the receipt said delivered. And we were like, oh, where, where is this set of books? <laughs> and it sat in a clothing store in town for several days. And they had no idea what it was. But when I finally got the set and opened it, it almost made you want to cry because like you're holding Thoreau's handwriting. And I think part of it is that we see where he ended up. You know, especially when you look at the, the struggles that he had in life and would he have any idea the impact that he would make decades, centuries later. Yeah. And here is like this book that comes home. And that's kind of what I feel when some of these books come back to Concord, just, just holding one, for example, this is Mark Fuller. But when they arrive back here, it's like having a friend come back. Because how else can we meet people from the past except through a book? And when you have something, whether it be, it doesn't have to be signed by them. You know, it could just be your regular, you know, scarlet letter paperback, but it's still a piece of that author that lived on after them. And for us, it's like a friend has come back home through the door when these books walk in here and they're just resting, waiting to visit with people. I mean, you don't have to buy it. You can just come see it or go on to its next journey. And there's something really cyclical about that. Was it, was it last exactly. year? I no, I, I was I was actually going to interrupt both of you and say like I think that it's really lovely that they're um, you know selling pieces and sort of chopping up Henry's journal so that you can actually have access to these pages and you know like essentially touch his DNA or whatever you know little yeah. cells that may have rubbed off you can sort of and look at his handwriting but then there's the other part of me where you know the like the book you know conservator part where I want right. all these journals to have just stayed together and not be sold off so I feel like I I feel both of these things but but you know I absolutely think Jamie that you're right that it's a matter of just connecting with these friends and feeling closer to them. And I think handwriting and signatures and, um, but also the way that they've chosen to, you know, arrange the, the words in inside the books themselves. Yeah. In a way, like breaking apart those writings, it almost feels exploitive because that was that person's 
journal, for example. Yeah. You know, it wasn't meant to be ripped apart and sold to many different people. Yes, I... Yeah, but at the same time, it's really nice to be able to look really closely. I know. <laughs> no, it is. It is. And I think the thing, you know, the, one, you know, the one book that came in the last year or so, you got a, a first edition of Thoreau's A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, which I remember when that book came in, the Thoreauvians everywhere were freaking out about it that you had actually gotten a first edition, <laughs> which is one of the rarest books that you can find. That and was that was a really exciting, exciting one. Because as I mean, as you and your viewers know, that was Thoreau's first book. No one was really interested in it. He had to pay to have it printed himself. And I think anyone who's ever been a writer or or actually tried to be a writer, you'd completely understand that struggle. And and the it does to your confidence, you know, sending out a book and nobody wants to publish it. So finally, Thoreau is like the classic example. I'm just going to do it. And he paid for it. Yeah, um, he had a thousand copies printed of those. I think 550 were bound and then the rest were uh, loose leaf. So it didn't sell. And he gets stuck with these books and he had to bring a number of them home. And they sat in the attic, as you know, in Concord. So we had one of the copies that was in the attic in Concord and it had notes in it. And we can't say for sure that they're thorough. It's presumed that they are. You can't say for sure. Because he did go through, as Richard would tell you, make notes in these books over time. Um, and those, eventually, those pages were bought by Tickner and Fields it was about a month before Thoreau was died. So he was actively dying. They bought them from him. And they bound it, their own title page in it. But recently, we've just had in another one of those books, but it's one of the ones that was bound. So it's the original eight. 49, first edition, first issue. And this one probably did sell at some point in Thoreau's lifetime. So we've heard other booksellers describe A Week on the Concord Merrimack as the greatest failure in American publishing history. But what's neat, when it comes back here today, and we, as you know, we took the other one up to Thoreau's grave just to show him, like, look, you made it, it made it. It's come back in a very different way than it did the first time. Yeah. Right. It's the famous story that when when James Monroe and company, his first publisher, returned the 706 unsold books to his house, he wrote in his journal famously, I now have a personal library of almost 900 volumes, over 700 of which I wrote myself. <laughs> and and for me personally, as a Thoreauvian, I consider the first book, A Week on the Concord of Merrimack Rivers, to be more of a holy grail uh, than mm. Walden itself because it did go through such a strange publishing history. And, and the first editions that didn't sell were, as you said, were rebound by Tickner and Fields. They're kind of a first edition for Tickner and Fields, but the actual book is like a second edition. I, I call it the 1.5 edition of A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. And, you know, for me, that's the to be up in like a bookstore in Maine somewhere. And I find a first edition for like $12. Oh, <laughs> you know, no. that's Which like back story is that again? <laughs> I wish, right? That's, yeah, that's the dream. That's the dream. So, and even when Walden was published, was he like, how many edition, how many, um, how many vol volumes of Walden were published when 2000. it actually, yeah, 2000. Yes. And did that book sell well? That one did better. And Emerson actually uh, knew Thoreau better by that time. And Emerson actually put in recommendation letters. So Emerson had written to publishers in England as well. And he, in his letter, he highly recommended, you know, have a young friend, Henry David Thoreau, you may be interested in his work, Walden. So by that point, he had a little bit more support probably of peers or even Emerson, I can be a little bit older, but someone to help promote him as well. What do you think, Richard? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you read A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, which he was writing at Walden Pond, so mm. he's 27 years old. It's his first book. Um, I love it, but, you know, it's a little clunky. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's like he's trying to use all the words, and he's trying to use all the thoughts and put them in there because it's his first book. Walden is much more streamlined. It's a much more of a mature book than the first one. And you can see the difference, even though it's only five years between the two books. And I think that Emerson and even Hawthorne, who who liked it, um, Bronson Alcott loved it. I think that they all saw that this was a much more mature, um, 
polished book than the first one, which is why I think a lot of his friends were really kind of putting their weight behind it and starting to suggest it to other people to read. Absolutely. Well, and he had, he had done, he had done like eight versions of an edit on Walden. It went through seven or eight drafts. Yeah. Yeah. And he had also been lecturing some of the, I know he, he took economy pieces of economy, that first chapter and, and, read that in front of audiences. So he was sort of polishing that in a different way. And, and he was also, he had published in the dial as well. The great well, when the first book, when the first book bombed in 1849, he had already started working on Walden. He completely stopped working on Walden for about two years from, from 1849 to about 1852. He didn't touch it at all. Um, and then eventually he started to pick it up again. By then he had been reading some of the Walden lectures, as you said, in public. And like Emerson, he would use those lectures to kind of polish the stuff that he was working on. And he would see what worked, what didn't work. Oh, the audience liked this. Oh, the audience didn't like that. I think that he wrote A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers strictly for himself. Whereas I think that you can see that he was working on Walden to be a book that the public would appreciate more than the first book. Interesting. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because in the, in the back of A Week on the Concord Merrimack, in the back of the first edition, uh, you will find an ad for Walden. It's telling readers to keep an eye out that Walden will be coming soon. So, Right, yeah. which was five years later, but it did show up. And it was completely, like we've said, two different publishers. And to be fair, James Monroe and company, they weren't publishers in the sense where they were going to promote the book. That's just not what they did. They right, were they not were like printers. Right, they were not like Tickner and Fields who would take out advertisements in newspapers and stuff like that. And Here again, exactly, I think... They were, they were just that just re-emphasize like how hard it is to promote your own work. I think many authors today also I can identify with that how hard it is to promote your work. So here you have the young Thoreau, not only responsible for paying to print it, he's got to promote it, and that's really hard to do. Yeah, and it was also a very um, a week on the Concord and Merrimack was also a very personal volume for him mm. because it was based on a two week um, camping trip that he had taken with his brother. And his brother had died very, very suddenly. And that, I think, you know, was one of the, um, I think, as a, as, as a writer myself and as somebody who's observed what happens when you lose somebody that close to you, there's this perennial ache that nothing can really um, remove. And the whole idea of going to Walden and just having time to, um, to spend thinking about his brother and nature and, you know, focusing on a book was a great way to sort of mourn and for him to get on to the next stage of his life. Cause he had wanted to be a teacher. You know, he had gone to Harvard. He had all these like, you know, quote unquote, great expectations for him yeah. um, that, and he didn't quite know how to fulfill it, but creating a book was a deeply personal thing. And then how do you promote that? How do you sort of you know, go out into the world and, and, you know, try to shamelessly plug it. It's that wasn't, that wasn't in his character. And he didn't want to do that. I mean, even after Walden came out, uh, he thought to himself, well, if I want this book to be a success, maybe I should go out and do something about it. And he made his name available to a series of lecture, lecture venues around the country. Um, saying, basically saying, look, I'm available to speak about my book. He only got one response, and that was from the Public Library Association of Akron, Ohio. Wow. <laughs> um, and Thoreau thought, yeah, I'm not going to go all the way to Akron just for one lecture. So he never did it. Um, but that was the only response that he got. Um, Emerson tried to get him to to try to get Thoreau to do more lecturing about Walden. But the fact of the matter is Thoreau just didn't really like to lecture and he didn't like to go out and promote himself. Um, you know, Emerson was kind of the master of that. Well, they all were. Emerson, um, Whitman was, was a master at promoting himself. Mm. Thoreau wasn't really that into it. He thought that his work should stand on its own and he wasn't really interested in being famous like, like Emerson or any of the other folks that he knew. Yeah. 
Yeah. So now that you bring up Emerson, let's let's talk a little bit about Emerson and how he um, like what his publishing history was like. Uh, I know that he had he had trained to be a minister and had then had gotten married and his lovely wife died very quickly. And so he he went through a great crisis, a crisis of conscience, crisis of faith, everything, and essentially left the ministry um, and then started writing. And he wrote Nature, um, I believe, at the Old Manse. Right, at the desk, yeah. Yeah. And... Um. Yeah, no, and I was going to say, and then Hawthorne, um, he wrote Mosses from an Old Manse because, of course, you know, a few years a few years after Emerson had published and had moved on to his own house, Emerson was renting out the Old Manse. And yeah, Hawthorne, so yeah, here you have these fascinating house hoppers, and this is something anyone who's visited or been in town, you all you know that they're all sharing. It seems like they share houses; they move back and forth. So you have Emerson's family's home built right next to North Bridge in Concord. And it was owned by his grandfather, William Emerson, who was the minister in Concord Center um, during the battle of April 19th, 1775. So the house stayed in the Emerson family. And then Ralph Waldo Emerson lived there for a short time. As we said, he wrote Nature in the upstairs room. And then Emerson eventually got his own house in Concord over on today's Cambridge Turnpike. And Hawthorne comes to town. He married uh, his wife, Sophia, in Sophia's sister's bookshop in Boston. So they were married in a bookstore, came to Concord the same day, and moved into the old manse. And in the same room where Emerson wrote Nature, Hawthorne wrote a number of his short stories. Some of them he'd already published in magazines and just kind of revised and compiled into books as well. But uh, what I always love about the manse is the difference where Emerson sat and where Hawthorne sat. Emerson sat from what I remember, looking out the window, he was inspired by the view where Hawthorne found the view distracting, so turned his desk to face the wall. And to me, that's so Puritan. Like, there will be no views, there will be no joy, there will be a wall, you know? And that's just the difference between their two writings in my mind. So, and his writing was, desk in his sky parlor in the wayside is the mm -hmm. same thing. He had his back to the window and the writing desk was facing the wall. Yeah. So I think I think Mr. Hawthorne was easily distracted. <laughs> I always feel like Hawthorne is pulling the stories from the ground of the past up through him, throughout through his pen, where Emerson's looking out into nature and letting man nature spirit come to him and then through his pen that way. So do you have any good Emerson books there at Barrow Bookshop? We have a number of Emerson books. Uh, we have some first editions in the case, and then we have a lot of regular ones. So things that we all love, like Emerson, The Mind on Fire, and then just a number of his, sorry, there's like three shelves right, <laughs> right underneath and around you right here. Just a number of different works of Emerson as well. We have one complete set of his journals and a couple sets of his writings as well. Um, do you find so of of the of the big four uh, Emerson, Thoreau, mm -hmm. Louisa, Hawthorne, which which ones are the most popular uh, of the four? Do you think? Well, Little Women, Little Women always is popular. Um, and one thing we noticed, remember when the movie came out last year, mm -hmm. uh, there were men coming in who had never read Little Women and just felt like maybe I should read it because they kept seeing all the ads and it had been years and they've grown up and never seen it or never read it. So that was interesting um, to see the different people who read Little Women. But Little Women, and then there's always always a need for Walden. A lot of people who visit Concord, and you know from being at Walden Pond, people who visit Concord want to pick up a copy of Walden here just to have the book that came from the town, you know, where it was right. written. Um, so that's always popular. And then I always push Hawthorne. His novels don't move that well, but uh, the short stories. <laughs> so I try and encourage people to read his short stories because I think sometimes in school, if you're made to read the longer volumes and it's not really up your alley, it can take the joy out of it. But if you know some of Hawthorne's history and this shame that he's carrying because of his great grandfather, that the hanging judge of the Salem witch trials, I mean, so much shame that Hawthorne changes the family name. And then those stories end up seep into his different uh, collections over the years. To me, like that's fascinating. So Hawthorne, he's talking about witchcraft and things that were going on in, in England where we were kind of quashing some of that over here. Like the church was the, had the final say on everything. 
But at the same time, like the Puritans were aware of witchcraft and these beliefs that they had, which are all rooted in old superstitions from England, Germany, different different places. But Hawthorne, he's not afraid to deal with, he winds them into his stories, which is, that's why I like his stories. Yeah. And, and also, so now now that you mentioned your short stories, mm. talk about how um, the Barrow has sort of um, created a YouTube series where you have people just reading their short stories. Yeah, we have an audio series that we share with the Talking Information Network for the Blind. And it's just a series of short story readings by or about conquered authors and beyond. So we just read short stories from Louisa May Alcott, a lot of Hawthorne, um, some of Emerson's poems and essays, some Margaret Fuller, and then every other author under the sun, whoever we feel like mixing in. And some of them are dramatized and they have music. And again, they're just, it's a free series. It's on YouTube, Barrel Bookstore audio series. And uh, it's also available for the blind as well. So, so, Jamie, let's talk a little bit about your family and, and your sister. Um, you kind of grew up in, in kind of a famous Concord home, didn't you? We did. We were extremely lucky. So we grew up in the Lucy Jackson Brown house, which is just opposite Emerson's house, like Cambridge Turnpike, a V like this. One side is Emerson's house. The other is Lucy Jackson Brown's house. So Lucy Jackson was the sister of Emerson's second wife. And Lucy's husband was accused of embezzling. They lived in Plymouth. Um, he was accused of embezzling and disappeared. So the thought is he probably left the country. But anyway, it left Lucy and two young children on their own. So Emerson turned the apple orchard across the street from his house and into a house for her. He had a cottage built. And it's built on top of one of the first 13 settlers' homes from Concord back in the 1600s. So the stones are somewhere in the basement. But uh, Emerson actually had his young friend, a surveyor, Henry David Thoreau, oversee the construction of the house. And uh, so Lucy lived lived there for many years. And when our parents bought the house, it needed a, a bit of work. So the contractors had to jack the entire house up. And they came to my parents afterwards to tell them that they had found in the sills of the house all these documents and old papers. But don't worry, we threw them away. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> my mother tried to find what dump do they take construction debris to she would have gone through by hand if she could just to find out what they might have been but yeah it was a house just there so the house eventually was owned by and I, i'm blanking on his first name but mr whitmore and he was also there at the same time emerson was still living across the street and whitmore was the bookseller and a postmaster in concord center and he was also known to not be very affectionate to his wife, and uh, he never spoke to her until the night that Emerson's house caught fire. And uh, the myth that gets passed down is that he told his wife to make coffee for the Emersons. And that was the first time people heard him speak to his wife in many years. So, uh, yeah, so that was the house. And it's still there. It's again, it's still it's a private home, but it's just opposite Emerson's house. And wasn't your house, so Henry Thoreau, young Henry Thoreau, wrote a poem called Sic Vita. Sic Vita. And, and did he, didn't he wrap that poem around a sprig of flowers and, and, and throw it through the window of, of the house that you grew up in? Yes, for, so for Emerson Lucy was Jackson. fond of Lucy Jackson Brown. She's actually the one who introduced him to Emerson, um, f from what I understand. So when right. Lucy was first left by her husband, she moved had moved into a boarding house owned by the Thoreau family. And there she met the young Henry David Thoreau. And, and I could be wrong. My understanding is that she's the one who introduced Thoreau to her brother-in-law, Emerson. Uh, Richard, you might know more than I do about that. That's just my memory of it. Yeah, that, yeah um, it, was, Emerson, it was that period where they were all kind of hanging out with each other. Okay. So Thoreau was younger than Lucy Jackson Brown, but they sounded like they were just lovely friends, you know, just nice friends. And yeah, um, some people say he was very fond of Lucy, that he might have loved Lucy. And he did write her another poem called, I am a parcel of vain strivings tied. And right. I think that was the one, Poss I, I don't know which one, my understanding was that one that he passed through the window with yeah. Violet. So he used to come to the house and he would play the flute and the children would dance. He would entertain her children. It just sounds like a lovely presence who came in and made their, not, their life nice, you know, after having 
that huge upheaval and the loss of their father like that. Now, so, how aware of all of those stories were you when you were a, a, a young girl growing up in that house? Oh, we were. That's part of the reason um, my mother really, really wanted that house. Because uh, she, again, really she felt that connection with Concord and the people. And Louisa May Alcott would have had tea there. Other people would have passed through. And there was a little old-fashioned parlor still in the front of the house. And what was interesting, it depends what people believe, but uh, I was young, maybe 10 years old, and I remember seeing a white figure at night go from the window across the room in the parlor. And I saw that several times when I lived there. And we also had a visitor come there who, she says that she is clairvoyant. This is her, her view of the world. And she said she always felt something very strong in that parlor, like they could feel a presence in that parlor. You know, whether it's what you believe or not, but it's just, it was interesting. You never know. Everybody has different experiences, different places. So. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. So wait, and also we, you you kind of skipped over the uh, the fire at Emerson's house. Can oh, yes. Back to that story? Yes. So Emerson's house, it, I don't remember the exact year off the top of my head. Uh, His 18, daughter. 1872. Okay, because he was getting old to be elderly at that yeah. point. Right. Uh, his daughter, Ellen Emerson, she writes an account of it. It's in her, The Letters of Ellen Tucker Emerson, and it's on our audio series. Um, but anyway, Emerson was at home that night. They had a new servant girl in the house, and there are different theories about how the fire started. One theory suggests that she was up in the attic for whatever reason, and she had a candle, and it started a fire. That's just one of the theories for how it could have started. And the story is that Emerson awoke to the smell of smoke, and he woke the household. They were, they were evacuating the house, and the smoke was getting worse and worse. Now, Emerson was part of the fire society. Concord had a fire department. It was all volunteer. Emerson was part of it. Um, the Grapevine Cottage. Why am I... Remind me his name. Um, Ephraim, Wales, Ephraim Bull. Wales Bull. Thank you. Bull's son was also part of it. Now, Bull's son had come back from the Civil War where he had lost an arm in a cannon accident. So he was part of the fire society as well. And what they had to do is go from their houses to Concord Center where the little fire wagon was kept. And they, they rushed this fire wagon down to Emerson's house. But by now, you're looking at half hour at least since fire has been detected. So all the neighbors came to help, including Louisa May Alcott, and I believe May Alcott was there as well. Um, it's in Ellen's, Ellen's letters. But Louisa was helping carry things out of the house as well. And Ellen writes about people trying to save the furniture. And then they, the smoke was just getting worse and worse. Somebody had to jump out a window just to save himself because the fire was going to be that bad. Finally, the fire engine is there. And the person who's up on the roof putting the fire out with one arm was Ephraim Wales Bull Jr. with his one arm. Yeah, so that was the fire. And it caused a fair amount of damage. Um, so the, the family had to leave the house. And Emerson ended up, I think he went to the manse. Somebody took him up to the manse just to rest and have something to eat. And I don't remember if he stayed there. But there was an effort in the town to raise money to help repair Emerson's house. So everybody really came together and surrounded. And I believe Ellen and her father then went overseas to England. That was a time, I think they, they went, went to Egypt. As well. They went to Egypt as well. Wow. They went to Egypt. Wow. One of the interesting stories about that. So when Ellen and her father were in Egypt, as most Americans did at the time, they had a houseboat that was on oh. the Nile. Yeah. And the the family that was next to them at the time. Uh, was a family from New York called the Roosevelts. And uh, one of the young boys was Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, my um, goodness. And they stayed on houseboats next to each other on the Nile in Egypt at the time. Now, so, did Teddy Roosevelt, I wonder, did he know who his neighbor was? I wonder. I can't. You know what? I can't remember off the top of my head. I certainly know in later years, of course, uh, Roosevelt knew who Emerson was because he did read him and the, and the other transcendentalists. Whether or not he knew it at the time, I'm not sure. But, but certainly Roosevelt's parents knew who Ralph Waldo Emerson was. So Emerson was gone for a long time on this travel through Europe and Egypt. And when he came back, um, that the house had been rebuilt and, and refurbished 
Um, and uh, I guess a great crowd met him at the train station and uh, he was taken home and the new home was unveiled uh, for him and, and Lydian uh, after the about a year or so after the fire had happened. Didn't they have children playing music and singing, I think, on the parade? Absolutely. It was but a big that deal story... that Mr. Emerson had come back. That story is like the perfect example of the six degrees of separation. Do you know who who you know? Like if it's Teddy Roosevelt knew Ralph or was close to Ralph Waldo Emerson. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of what I feel with book. It's like the six degrees. We, they connect all of us somehow. You know, whether you, you meet somebody, it could be a total stranger. But if you've read somewhere along the line, there is that connection. And it could just be through a character or an author of a book. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of what makes, to me, bookshops so alive. To me, you know, they're not just books on a shelf. They're hundreds of stories that we are surrounded by, you know? So, Jamie, Absolutely. before we wrap up, uh, why don't you let us know what your hours are there at the Barrow Bookstore and, and how COVID has affected your hours? Thank you. So our normal hours, and we're still open normal hours, are 9.30 until 5, Monday through Saturday. And Sunday, it's 12 until 4.30. And with COVID, we're doing one group at a time inside, so you don't have to worry about mixing with other other people at the moment. So you can walk up if nobody's here, come on in, or if somebody's here, just wait. Or you can book in advance to save a time so you don't have to wait. And you could come with people you're already with, you know, who are already in your circle. That's your choice. And then you can come and just have a private half hour visit. And we've also started a website um, for our, for our books, so the books are online, and we're always adding to them. And it's just Barrow Bookstore, Barrow like a wheelbarrow that you push. So BarrowBookstore.com. And then we have a Facebook page with a really nice community, and we have four p.m. tea every day. Everybody's invited to join us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it's not just books. They also have mugs and tea towels and a whole a whole good variety. And if there's ever a book in particular you're looking for, uh, you know, especially, you know, Concord focused or whatever, it's, it's always a good idea to reach out to them um, to see if they can either track it down or maybe they have it or, you know. Thank you. Re- reach out because I feel like you guys are very responsive and and lovely to to talk to and interact and and uh, you know or call them on the telephone. You still do that. Yay! So thank you so much for for coming and joining and having this lovely conversation. Well, thank um, you and thank all your viewers for spending this time with us in the bookstore. Thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you, absolutely. Thank you. Take Have care. We'll, we'll see Bye. you next time on Concord Days. And happy reading. Bye. Happy reading.